If you have your Bibles this morning, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we're going to look at verse 14 as our opening text this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 14, I'm going to ask if you're able to please stand for the reading of God's word. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, this is a verse that many of you have probably heard before. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Paul writes to the believers at Corinth, and he says, Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? You may or may not recall, but not too many months ago, we did an entire series through Paul's letters to Corinth. And during that series, we talked about this verse and all of the various verses in this book. Of course, when we come to this verse, it is most often thought of when we think of finding someone to marry. What does the Bible say about that? And the counsel that we often refer to comes from this verse, do not be bound to an unbeliever. But this verse applies to so much more than just marriage. It applies to all sorts of different relationships and circumstances. And we're going to talk about that today and see that demonstrated today in our message. Father God, as we take time now to listen to the word of God, your word, Lord, I pray that you would speak to us through it. Lord, we understand that your word is a living word. It's not a dead word. It is not a word that you said. It is a word that you are saying right now. And so God, help us to listen to your wisdom. Help us to listen to your truth. And help us to apply it to our lives and live by it. That we might be transformed in the image of Jesus Christ. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. As you're being seated, turn back to 2 Kings chapter 22. 2 Kings chapter 22. We are going to be looking at a few verses from this chapter today. As you know, we have been in a new series titled The Divided Church. We are looking at the era of Old Testament history during which the kingdoms of Israel were split into two parts, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. We have used the book of 1 Kings, and we will get into 2 Kings here in a couple of weeks, as our primary text, as these books are specific to that time period in Old Testament history. However, last week we introduced... Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat is the fourth king of the southern kingdom of Judah. He reigned from approximately 893 to 869. We learned a little bit about him last week. If you remember, we discovered last week that he was a good ruler. He was a godly king who aspired to lead the southern kingdom in a righteous manner to follow and revere the name of God. And as a result, we read that God established him, established his kingdom, made him strong, made him well respected by the nations around so that they maintained peaceful relationships with him during his early reign. We also discovered in the early part of chapter 22 that Jehoshaphat, despite all of his righteousness and good qualities, decided to align himself with King Ahab, the wicked, idolatrous, bell-worshipping king of Israel. This was a foolish error on Jehoshaphat's part. And if you remember, and if you don't remember, just go back and read chapter 22, the allied forces of Jehoshaphat and Ahab went up to fight against 
the Arameans and reclaim a city that had fallen into the Arameans' hands. And when they went up to battle, their forces were soundly defeated. King Ahab was killed. And King Jehoshaphat barely escaped with his life. This morning we will pick up right there where we stopped last week. In the immediate aftermath of this crushing defeat. Now, interestingly, Jehoshaphat is the one king that the writer of Kings kind of overlooks. As we go throughout this series, Jehoshaphat is the one king that has very, very little information about him in the book of Kings. And so, for the sake of this morning, we're going to have to go to Chronicles to get more information. And so keep your spot marked in 1 Kings, but turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 19, where we will find a more detailed account of King Jehoshaphat. And we'll start there this morning. The first point there on your outline, if you have it, is called rebuke and reform. Rebuke and reform. Second Chronicles chapter 19, starting in verse 1. Then Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, the southern kingdom, returned in safety to his house at Jerusalem. And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord and so bring wrath on yourself from the Lord? But there is some good in you, for you have removed the Asherah from the land, and you have set your heart to seek God. So Jehoshaphat lived in Jerusalem and went out again among the people from Beersheba to the hill country of Ephraim and brought them back to the Lord, the God of their fathers. Now for the sake of time, I'm not going to read the rest of this chapter. I encourage you to do so as we talk this morning. But here's what happened. Following the death of Ahab and the disastrous failure of Ahab and Jehoshaphat's alliance in their attempt to reclaim the lost city of Ramoth Gilead, Jehoshaphat, as we read in verse 1, returned from the battle in safety to his palace in the capital city of Jerusalem. But when he returned, Jehu who was the son of Hananiah, a prophet, came to the king to meet him. Now, just so we can continue to grow in our knowledge of Scripture and make connections, let me just point out that this Jehu, the prophet, was the same Jehu who had prophesied to King Baasha back during his reign. We have mentioned him before in this series. Some 30 years or so has passed, and Jehu is still alive and still ministering there in uh, that area. But Jehu was mentioned first in 1 Kings 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, Jehu comes to Jehoshaphat after he has returned from the battle, and he rebukes him, bringing him the word of the Lord. And he asks a question there in verse 2, which is worth repeating. He asked the king, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? He's talking about Ahab and the idolatrous northern kingdom. Why have you, Jehoshaphat, a godly, God-fearing king who has done everything in his power to, to revitalize and, and point your kingdom in the south to God? Why have you love the wicked? Why have you aligned yourself with the wicked king Ahab in Israel so that, look at that in verse 2, so to bring wrath upon yourself from the Lord. He said, why would you enter into such an alliance so as to provoke God? No, nothing good is possibly going to come out of that. 
That was a foolish decision. You're a good man. You're a godly man. Look at verse 33. He's, uh, verse 3. He says, I acknowledge there's good in you. I acknowledge that you removed the Asherah, which is a false idol. I acknowledge that you've tried to purify the land that you've set your heart to seek God. But that was a mistake that you made. And you barely survived. If you remember, the Arameans thought for a moment that Jehoshaphat was Ahab. Remember, they were chasing him. They were going to kill him. And at the last minute, they realized, oh, that's not the guy we think it is. And they broke off their pursuit and went elsewhere. But Jehoshaphat was, was this close to getting killed because of this foolish decision that he had made. Well, perhaps... Jehoshaphat felt convicted by his choice to fight alongside the wicked king Ahab. And as a result, he renewed his efforts to reform Judah to the obedience to God. He said, you know what, I made a mistake. <laughs> I'm not going to wallow in it. I'm not going to, you know, just let it pull me down but I screwed up. He acknowledged he screwed up. And he said, you know what? We're going to turn things around. I'm going to get back to being the king I used to be. I'm going to get back to being the leader and the man that I used to be. And so he began implementing a new round of reforms in the southern kingdom. Now, I didn't read all those verses, but if you read verses 5 through the end of this chapter, you will discover some of the reforms that he instituted now after uh, having kind of got kicked in the pants just a little bit. He appointed judges to serve in the cities throughout the southern kingdom that were fair, that were impartial, that were upright, that were righteous. We read here that he appointed priests and Levites and respected elders and, and household leaders to resolve disputes among the people in Jerusalem and he instructed them to render judgments that honored the law of the Lord that were rendered in fear of the Lord. Beloved, if I could simplify all of that, what he did is he reformed the court system of his day. He got rid of the corrupt Judges, and he replaced them with God fearing judges. And he placed this legal system under the headship of Amariah, the chief priest, and Zebediah, the king's official. Now, I, I, I would just, on an aside, add wouldn't it be nice if we had God fearing courts and judges? We don't, by the way, for the most part. We have some. But all you got to do is watch the news and you will learn that our justice system is broken. Just like so much of our country. Jehoshaphat implemented a God-fearing, just court system. The second point this morning there on the outline is called invasion and prayer. Invasion and prayer. We're in verse 1 of chapter 20. Now it came about after this, that's referring to the reforms that he had implemented, that the sons of Moab and the sons of Ammon, together with some of the Menuhites, came to make war against Jehoshaphat, and some came and reported to Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat saying, a great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea. They're coming out of Aram, and behold, they are currently in Hazan Tamar, which is in Gedi. Jehoshaphat was afraid. He turned his attention to seek the Lord and proclaim a fast throughout Judah. So Judah gathered together to seek help from the Lord. They even came from all the cities of Judah to seek 
the Lord. Again, time restricts me from being able to read all of this, but I encourage you to continue reading to verse 13. Let me summarize what's going on. You see, up to this point in his reign, Jehoshaphat had been established by God, and as I mentioned in the introduction, he was strong, he was respected, and the surrounding nations left him alone. They feared his strength. But, in the wake of his disastrous, humiliating defeat with Ahab, the traditional enemies of Judah, who had kept quiet for a decade plus, began to see that Jehoshaphat might be vulnerable. After all, his army fighting along the Israelites of Ahab was defeated. And so perhaps this reputation that Jehoshaphat had was not as, as ironclad as it had been thought. And so the Moabites from the neighboring nation of Moab and the Ammonites from another neighboring nation of Ammon, along with some others who joined alongside them, decided they were going to test his strength out. And so they combined forces and they invaded the southern kingdom of Jehoshaphat, which had been at peace for some 20 years. A large army, a multitude, the Bible says, invaded the land and camped at En Gedi. Now, En Gedi is mentioned multiple times throughout the Bible. En Gedi was a, and still is, by the way, an oasis in the middle of the desert region on the western shore of the Dead Sea. You can go to a map and find it. Now, if it's on the western shore of the Dead Sea, that means it is located inside the borders of Israel. In other words, this enemy army had already crossed into Israel, and they were camped in Israel, making their way towards the capital city. They were invading the land to put Jehoshaphat and his army to the test. You notice what Jehoshaphat did? First of all, he said he was afraid. This is the first time in his kingship that his sovereign territory has been invaded by a foreign force. But what did he do? He declared a fast in the kingdom and he called the people to national prayer. In fact, he called those who were able to join him in Jerusalem at the temple that they might together seek the Lord. Now I didn't read verses 5 through 13, but that is the text of his prayer. You see what happened is all of the people who were able from the southern kingdom came and gathered in a grand assembly there in Jerusalem. And the king stood up before them and began to pray on behalf of the nation. I wish we had leaders that did that today. And if you read the words of his prayer, let me summarize basically what he said. He recalled how God had brought his people out of Egyptian captivity during the days of Moses. How he had settled them in the promised land that he had promised to Abraham and his descendants. He spoke in his prayer of how during the Exodus, their ancestors had traveled through the, the kingdoms of the Edomites, the Moabites, and the Ammonites, and had for the most part left them alone in peace. And then he lamented that these same nations 
had now in the latter days risen up against Judah. And the scripture says that as all of the families that were gathered there listened on, I, lo I love it, look, look at verse 13. All of Judah was standing before the Lord, their infants, their wives, and their children. It wasn't just the men, it was, it was the babies, the families, the kids. As they were all there gathered, listening to the king pour out his heart before God. He pleaded with the Lord to intervene and to save Judah from the powerful hands of his enemies. Beloved, that is leadership. That's leadership. The third point this morning is called assurance and success. Assurance and success. We pick up the story in verse 14. As they were praying, then in the midst of the assembly, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jehiel, the son of Mananiah, the Levite of the sons of Asa. And he said, Listen, all of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the king Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord to you. Do not fear or be dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go down against them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the valley in front of the wilderness of Jericho. You will need not fight in this battle, but station yourselves. Stand and see the salvation of Jerusalem. I'm sorry. Stand and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf of Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go down to face them, for the Lord is with you. Jehoshaphat bowed his head to the face of the ground, and all of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down, worshiping the Lord and the Levites and the sons of the Kohathites and the sons of the Korahites, who stood up to praise the Lord of Israel with a loud voice. And then they rose early in the morning, and they went out to the wilderness of Tekoa. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, O Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, put your trust in the Lord, your God, and he will establish you. Put your trust in his prophets and succeed. And when they consulted the people, he appointed those who sang to the Lord and those who praised him in holy attire. And they went out before the army, singing, Give thanks to the Lord, for his loving kindness is everlasting. And when they began singing and praising the Lord, God sent ambushes against the sons of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir and those who had come against Judah so that they were routed. For the sons of Ammon and Moab rose up against those of Mount Seir and destroyed them completely. And when they had finished uh, with the inhabitants of Seir, they helped destroy each other. And when Judah came and looked out towards the wilderness, they looked towards the multitude and behold, there were corpses lying on the ground and no one had escaped. And Jehoshaphat and his people came and found much spoil among them, including goods, garments, and valuable things that they took for themselves so much that they couldn't carry it all. And they were three days in taking spoil because there was so much. Again, I'm going to stop there, but keep reading. Verses 26 and following. Beloved, Jehoshaphat had called all of the people of the southern kingdom who could possibly come to, to Jerusalem, and they all came. And he prayed and he sought the Lord. And as he did so, Scripture tells us that the Spirit of God fell. And it came upon Jehaziel the prophet. And Jehaziel the prophet stood up and spoke the word of the Lord and assured the people, assured the king, not to be afraid because God would deliver them from the invading multitude. He even foretold the path by which the enemy would approach, coming up the ascent of Ziz. And he instructed the army of Judah under the leadership of King Jehoshaphat to go out and meet them in battle. To go out and confront the approaching forces. But here's the amazing thing. Did you catch this? He said, 
Prepare yourself to defend your nation, but you're not going to have to do any fighting at all. You're not going to have to wield the sword. You're not going to have to shoot the arrow. All you've got to do is show your willingness to confront and be prepared. Station yourself to meet the approaching enemy. But God will fight on your behalf. And so, as I read, early the next morning, Jehoshaphat ordered the army and they went out to meet the approaching adversary. Jehoshaphat, as we read here, encouraged the men to trust in the Lord, to trust in the word of his prophets, to believe and have confidence in the power of God. And did you notice what he did here? That I love this part. King Jehoshaphat appointed singers, not soldiers, singers, to go before the army, singing and praising and giving thanks and worship to the Lord. You know, usually they say the Marine Corps goes in first, cleans things up, and then the army comes in and follows through and, and, and does. No, in this case, Jehoshaphat had a different strategy. We're going to let our praise and worship team go first. We're going to let them sing praises to the Lord. And the troops will follow behind them. You see what happened here? Did you, did you catch that? Verse 22. When they began singing and praising, the Lord set ambushes against the sons of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir. God sent supernatural confusion into the enemy camp. By the way, this is not the only time in the Bible God uses this strategy. And they became so deluded by the confusion that God sent upon them that they began to kill each other. They began to slay one another. And it says that this continued until every single one of them was dead by their own hands. Meanwhile, the army of Judah approached the vantage point where they had been commanded to go meet the incoming army. And did you notice in those verses what happened? When they arrived and stationed themselves and looked out over the, over the valley to where they anticipated the Moabites and Ammonites and great multitude would be coming, what did they see? They saw a valley full of dead bodies, slain and scattered as far as the eye could see across the field. Wow. The enemy had completely destroyed itself. The Bible says not one of them escaped. They all killed each other. In fact, Scripture says that the king ordered his troops to go down and collect spoil from the battlefield, and it took them three days. That's how much spoil there was. Three days to gather up all of the goods and garments and valuables that the Ammonite Moabite alliance had left behind. Now, I didn't read the verses that follow, but if you keep going there, on the fourth day, after the three days of gathering up the spoils, on the fourth day, Judah's army all assembled there in the Valley of Baraka, which, by the way, is just a Hebrew word that means blessing. And what did they do? They blessed the Lord. That's why it's called the Valley of Blessing, for giving them a great victory. And then they returned triumphantly to Jerusalem, singing and playing musical instruments as they came, just as they had when they had gone to battle. And when the word spread 
throughout Judah and to the surrounding nations of how God had intervened on Judah's behalf, all of the surrounding nations once again were filled with a holy fear and a dread as they had previously felt towards Judah and Jehoshaphat, and they resumed their policy of peacekeeping with the southern kingdom. Which brings us to the end of this chapter. Look at verse 31 and following. The last point is called displeased and destroyed. Now Jehoshaphat reigned over Judah. He was 35 when he became king and he reigned for 25 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Azubah, the daughter of Chile. He walked in the ways of his father Asa and did not depart from it, doing right in the sight of the Lord. The high places, however, were not removed. The people uh, had not yet directed their hearts to the God of their fathers. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat from first to last are they not written in the annals of Jehu, who we mentioned a while ago, the son of Hananiah? which is recorded in the book of the kings of Israel. By the way, those verses there are almost verbatim in 2 Kings. We read them last week. Let's look at this one last little incident in this chapter we haven't yet discussed. After this, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, aligned himself with Ahaziah, the king of Israel. He acted wickedly in doing so. He allied himself with him to make ships to go to Tarshish, and they made those ships in Ebion Gezer. Then Eliezer, the son of uh, Da'avahu uh, uh, of Merisha, prophesied against Jehoshaphat, saying, Because you have allied yourself with Ahaziah, the Lord has destroyed your work, so the ships were broken and could not go to Tarshish. Now, at this point, turn back to 2 Kings. I told you to mark it earlier. That last little bit that I just read about the ships is all that we have here in 2 Kings. Go to 2 Kings 47. There was no king in Edom. There was a deputy king, or a deputy was king. And here it is. Jehoshaphat made ships to go to Tarshish to go to Ophir for gold, but they did not go because the ships were broken at Ezi and Geber. And Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, said to Jehoshaphat, Let my servants go with your ships. But Jehoshaphat was unwilling. And then Jehoshaphat slept with his fathers and was buried uh, in the father of uh, the city of his father David. And Jehoram, his son, became king in his place. That little blurb in 2 Kings, or 1 Kings, thank you, Oman, is, is really about all we have in 1 Kings. That's why we had to go to Chronicles to get all the rest of the information. But let's talk a little bit about this alliance. God had just delivered Jehoshaphat and the people of Judah miraculously from the invading horde of Moabites, Ammonites, and Edomites. Sometime there in the aftermath of that great victory, we read that Jehoshaphat engaged in a joint initiative with Ahaziah. Now, we haven't talked about Ahaziah yet. We're going to talk about him next week in 2 Kings chapter 1. But Ahaziah was the son of Ahab, the man who got killed in the battle that we studied last week. Ahab was an evil, wicked, idolatrous king who served to worship Baal, and his wife was Jezebel, one of the most awful women in all of the Bible. Perhaps in all of human history. So much so that in the play they called poor Savannah Jezebel. Ahaziah was just as bad as his daddy. He was a wicked, awful person too. Like father, like son, right? He had been raised to serve Baal and to worship idols also. And yet, we read that Jehoshaphat joined together with Ahaziah in order to build a ship of merchant uh, vessels, uh, build a fleet of merchant ships that would be utilized to travel to Tarshish. 
Marcia said, but I heard of that before. Yeah, that's where the prophet Jonah tried to flee to. Remember, Jonah got on a ship to go to Tarshish because he was running from God. Tarshish, just a little geography lesson, is on uh, the southern tip of Spain. Now remember in biblical times, that was the end of the world. They hadn't discovered the new world yet. That would be centuries later. And so Tarshish was the end of the world. You had to sail from uh, Israel all the way across the Mediterranean Sea, all the way to get to Tarshish, which was on the edge of the Atlantic. They built a fleet that would be commercial shipping uh, vessels that could travel to Tarshish and also Ophir. We read Ophir. Why did they go to Ophir? Because Ophir was renowned for its gold. So these ships were capable of carrying gold, which is heavy. These were serious ships. Ophir, you can read about Ophir when you go back and read the story of Solomon. You know why? Because when Solomon built the temple, he shipped in gold from Ophir. And so this was a big undertaking. They were building a fleet of merchant vessels that was going to greatly enhance the economy of both the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. Apparently they were going to share them, and so they came together to build them. But look what happened there. In Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, it says, Then Eliezer, the son of Donahu, who I just, I just read this verse, came to Jehoshaphat and prophesied against him, saying, Because you have allied yourself with Ahaziah, the Lord has destroyed your works. And the Bible doesn't tell us how it happened, but it tells us that the ships were broken at Ebion Gezer. In other words, they didn't work. Something went wrong. Maybe they wrecked, maybe they crashed, maybe they were faulty in their construction. God saw to it that these ships were destroyed and he sent a prophet to tell Jehoshaphat, your actions are displeasing to God. Think about that. Jehoshaphat allied himself with Ahab, almost lost his life, was humiliated, as a result of his foolishness, he faced disastrous consequences. And the prophet Jehu came and told him, that was a stupid thing to do to align yourself with a wicked, idolatrous king. And you would think, you would think that Jehoshaphat would have learned his lesson. And then a few years passed. This godly, righteous, otherwise very upright man does it again. He aligns himself with Ahab's wicked son, this time to build a commercial fleet. There is no telling how much money was wasted here. There is no telling how much the economy, if you will, suffered as a result of this embarrassing alliance. The ships were destroyed, the project failed. And it was yet another stain on an otherwise very good resume for righteous King Jehoshaphat. Well, let's close this morning. Beloved, the Bible tells us, history records, that Jehoshaphat, for the most part, was an honorable man. He was a good king. He was a righteous king. He aspired to lead his nation in the fear of the Lord. He initiated many godly reforms, both early in his reign and later in his reign. He aspired to bring his people closer to God. He modeled excellent leadership in front of his people. And yet, no one is perfect. Jehoshaphat seemed to have a tendency for whatever reason. Maybe he was soft-hearted. I don't know. But he seemed to have a tendency to entangle himself 
in alliances with evil, wicked people. As we read last week, and I'll talk about this morning, he foolishly, naively joined together with wicked King Ahab in his battle against Aram, and as a result, his forces were decimated. He barely escaped with his life. And his reputation was weakened, which led subsequently to an invasion that probably wouldn't have happened had he remained strong and resolute. He was rebuked by the prophet of God for his poor decision. And the Moabites and the Ammonites brought fear and terror upon the land for a time, something that probably would have never even happened if he would have not aligned himself with Ahab. A few years later, again, for reasons that are unknown but unfathomable to me, he did it again. Jehoshaphat teamed up with Ahab's contemptible son, Ahaziah, in an effort to build a fleet of merchant ships, apparently to serve his country and the northern kingdom as well. And once again, God sent another prophet, Eliezer, to come and rebuke him again for his foolish mistake, his naivety. And God destroyed the ships so that they were rendered unusable and the project ended up being another failure. Beloved, I'd like to say that those were the only outcomes of Jehoshaphat's alliances with Ahab and his family, but they're not. I mentioned last week in 2 Chronicles 17 that one of the things Jehoshaphat did in order to maintain friendly relationships with the northern kingdom is he allowed his son, Jehoram, to marry Ahab's daughter, Adaliah. Now, you might think to yourself, well, that's not a big deal. But here's the problem. Adaliah was just as wicked as Ahab and Jezebel. She grew up worshiping Baal, and she grew up watching her parents conspire against the innocent, do evil, corruptible things, and she, she was the same way. Now, we haven't gotten there yet, beloved, but don't forget this. Because when Jehoshaphat dies here a few chapters from now, guess who's going to become the king? His son, Jehoram. And guess who's going to be his wife? Evil ally. And beloved, we're going to read some disastrous consequences that will befall the southern kingdom because of the result of this unequally yoked marriage. Joseph Ad was a good king, but bless his heart, he made some poor choices. The Bible teaches us, and I close right where we started this morning, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. The Bible teaches us not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. We most often apply this, as I said earlier, to a marriage relationship. The world will say this. That's because you think you're better than us. That's because you think that you're more pious and more just... I don't know, special than we are. No, that has nothing to do with it. God loves all of us, the lost and the saved. I'm no better than anybody else, and neither are you. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with common sense. 
Beloved, if you are a believer and you trust in the Lord for your salvation and you aspire to live a life of discipleship committed to serving Him and to fulfilling the purpose for which you were created, then you don't need to be bound in a covenant relationship with someone who lives a lifestyle contrary to the Lord. Someone who does not believe in God. Someone who actively engages in sinful, rebellious, worldly behavior. Why? Because what association or partnership does light have with darkness? Friend, they will pull you down. You're not going to pull them up. They're going to pull you down. Mounds of observation and evidence shows that same thing. The Bible is not saying don't be unequally yoked because you're better than them. The Bible is saying don't be unequally yoked because they will destroy you. They will pull you away from the Lord. Beloved, that is a piece of wise counsel. And it doesn't just apply to marriage. It applies to to so many different circumstances in our lives as we have seen this morning. Beloved, we as the children of God should avoid becoming allied with or partnered with or contractually bound to or covenant covenantally tied to evil, sinful, ungodly people or groups of people. This should be common sense. Nothing good will come out of that. It is displeasing to God and ultimately the results will be displeasing to us as well. It is a recipe for trouble. Yes, we are to live in this world. Yes, we see and associate and even befriend lost people in our world all the time, in our work, in our community, in our lives. We are not to shun or withdraw from the world, but that's it. We are not to bind ourselves in serious committed, covenantal-type relationships, whatever that form might be, with lost people. And if we do so, can I be honest, we are stupid for doing so. We're stupid for doing so. And bless his heart, Jehoshaphat found this out multiple times in his lifetime, and so will the generations that follow him, as we'll discover in the chapters to come. Let's pray. Father God, your word, your word records events that happened centuries ago. And yet, the truth of your word is relevant today in every single generation. God, help us realize that these stories aren't just old, antiquated tales. Lord, they are filled with principles. They are filled with truths. They are filled with examples that we need to take to heart and we need to live by. Lord, you teach us through your word timeless truths that if we would heed them and apply them and live by them, it would transform our lives. God, help us to be students of your word. Help us to listen and obey. Not just for our own benefit, but for that of others, for the world around us, and because it is pleasing and right in your eyes. God, help us not to be unequally yoked, 
with unbelievers. God, I pray that if there's anyone here this morning as we close our service today who has any decision to make, that they would make that in accordance and obedience with you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.